what we're going to do is we're going to deal with personification. This is a literary term. For all y'all who don't know what personification is, it's when somebody takes an inanimate object and gives it human attributes or God attributes, individual attributes. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, and what does it say right here in, um, here we go, Proverbs 1 and verse 20. Look what it says right here. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the street. Notice personification is given to wisdom. Wisdom is not literally a woman. This is personification, people. Jesus taught in parables. Par using parables is using metaphoric or allegory. So when you use metaphors and allegory, you use a lot of personification. This is what is going on with the Holy Spirit. What Stanley is looking at is personification, and he thinks he's dealing with a literal individual. But the evidence will show when you weigh it next to the actual individual, like God the Father and God the Son, you will see that the Holy Spirit must be personification or symbolically a person when you weigh the evidence. Let's take another look at an example of personification. We're going to go to Psalms 148 and verse 1. Psalms 148 and verse 1. Now, listen to this. Pay close attention to what you're reading. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Okay, we know that angels can literally praise God. They're individual. Listen to them. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. This is biblical language, sisters and brothers. Something Stanley apparently doesn't understand. Biblical language uses personification. It gives gender and human attributes to inanimate objects, including, brace yourself, the power of God, like a force. Remember, Stanley said a force can't think, a force can't breathe, a force, literally it can't, but if you personify it, it can. Just like I can say, a sun cannot breathe, the moon cannot breathe. But well, let me show you this. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 13. More personification. This is in the Bible. When you understand personification, then you can understand the Holy Spirit. This is Isaiah 13 and verse 9. Look at what it says right here. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes with cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, and the sun shall be dark in his going forth, and in his going forth, no to refer to the sun as a he, as a person. Look what it says right here. And the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Yet I don't see any Christians contending that the sun and the moon and the stars are living, breathing individuals. Well, it said her. Okay, let's see about emotions. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 24. Because grieving is an emotion. He said, inanimate objects don't grieve. I agree with you, Stanley, but if that's the case, explain this. This is Isaiah 24, verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. And after many days shall they be visited. Verse 23. Then the moon shall be confounded, which means ashamed, and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Being ashamed, sisters and brothers, are emotion. If you want to ask the average person right now, can the sun or the moon be ashamed? They'll say no. So how come your Bible is saying that the sun and the moon is ashamed? Because that's personification. God always used personification to communicate with us, to help us understand the unprocessable. So when Jesus personified the Holy Spirit, he didn't do it to try to make people think the Holy Spirit was an actual person, because nobody before that time ever thought that. If you go read the entire Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is never described as an individual. So why is it when you all of a sudden get to Jesus, it's all personified? It's a he. He does this. He's going to teach you that. Because Jesus taught in parables, sisters and brothers. And there are many times when Jesus taught in parables, and they didn't even tell you that he was teaching the parable. But the content lets you see that. But most importantly, Stanley mentioned Paul. 
Let's take a look at how Paul always greeted every letter that he opened with and notice that the Holy Spirit is never mentioned. Romans 1 and 7. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Where's the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 1 and 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Where's the Holy Spirit? Notice when you try to weigh in allegory or a personification up against a literal person or person, the personification doesn't show up because it's not a real person. 2 Corinthians 2 and 1. I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. No Holy Spirit mentioned there. Galatians 1 and 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does Paul keep omitting the Holy Spirit if he's a part of this Godhead, if there's a trinity? Ephesians 1 and 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Still no Holy Spirit. Philippians 1 and 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're weighing evidence here, sisters and brothers. No sign of the Holy Ghost. Colossians 1 and 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Still no Holy Ghost. First Thessalonians 1 and 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't see the Holy Ghost, do y'all? Second Thessalonians 1, verses 1 through 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is Paul being rude? Why is Paul being disrespectful? Why is the Holy Spirit sitting, chilling right up there with grace from peace and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? First Timothy 1 and 2. Grace, mercy, peace from God our Father, Jesus Christ our Lord. Why is Paul only the Holy Spirit here to be part of the Godhead? Because Paul is dealing with actual individuals here, not personification. Second Timothy 1 and 2. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Not one letter contains the opening with the Holy Spirit in it. Finally, Philemon 3. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is the Holy Spirit always up out of these greetings? Because here, Paul is mentioning actual individuals. No symbology, sisters and brothers. No allegory. No metaphors. Actual individuals who exist. 